and welcome to the first session of Hacks for Hybrid Working. Um, I'm so excited to be doing this, Marin and I. We've been talking about this for quite a while, and so it's great to be finally here. Uh, I'm joined today, like I just said, uh, by uh, with Marin, uh, and we're going to be spending the next couple of weeks talking about hybrid working hacks for hybrid working, our relationships with digital tools and everything that that entails. And so I wanted to start first, uh, Marin, by letting you introduce yourself uh, and talk about who we are and why we're here. Oh, hi, Lauren. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be kicking off this week in Hacks for Hybrid Working. Um, I'm Dr. Marin Deepwell, and I have been, yeah, I think having hybrid work experience for over a decade. Um, and since 2017, I've led a completely um, remote and hybrid blended workforce. Um, so I've kind of been through a whole transition from working in an office where we have a who makes coffee rota um, and a dress code in a very traditional kind of, you know, UK higher education kind of background to, you know, literally packing up the boxes of office equipment mm -hmm. and closing the office door for the last time. And then, you know, entering the brave new world of the virtual workplace, um, where we arrived a few years before 2020, um, when so many of us had to adopt a hybrid working um, and fully online working environment. Um, and now I've kind of come out at the other end, you know, and I'm very mindful of you know it being really challenging like even if you're super digitally literate and really good with technology and a big fan of technology um working from home and hybrid working in general um brings with it a whole new set of challenges and requires a whole new set of skills so i'm really interested in you know working with you all for the next four weeks and exploring yeah how we can help that's great um I have been, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been in a similar position, I think, over the last many years working in a remote and virtual setting, too. So uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Lauren Hanks. Uh, I'm the director of operations at Reclaim Hosting. And Reclaim Hosting is a small web hosting company that is entirely remote. So our our growing team is, you know, uh, distributed across the United States and we've got Jim in Italy. And at one point we did have an office location in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and it was actually a co-working space. And we were, again, just thinking about working even at that stage and different working models that make sense for folks. And we opened it up to the community and that was really exciting. Uh, but I think ultimately, um, you know, it just made sense for our team and the work that we're doing that, you know, we wanted to give folks the flexibility of working in their homes and working wherever they wanted in the world. So I've uh, worked remotely from Spain. I've uh, and, and now I'm, I'm stationed in uh, Florida with my husband. And, um, you know, and so it's been a, a journey of, of trying to um, think about the best ways of of, of doing good work in virtual settings. And so I'm really looking forward to uh, ch chatting with you, Marin, and, and chatting with folks in Discord and throughout the, the Q&A times over the next couple of weeks um, about the pros and cons of that and um, really kind of you know, reflecting on where we are currently and where we hope to be with our, our working habits. So uh, definitely super excited and looking forward to it. So uh, with that, Marin, should we chat first maybe about uh, the welcome post and maybe how folks can participate over the coming weeks? Absolutely. So we very much hope that this course, which is designed to be an exploration of hybrid working and how it shapes our relationship with digital tools, will provide you with food for thought and practical resources and tools. Um, as you know, we explore what it means that hybrid working is here to stay. Um, whether, you know, some of you might be here thinking, um, I'm just curious, maybe I'm looking for some new tools or some tips. Um, maybe others are looking for a 
hopefully post pandemic or increasingly post pandemic work life balance and um, just thinking about sort of well being or personal goals and progress when it comes to hybrid working. Um, or you might be in a position where you're supporting colleagues, um, academics, or students to find a way around um, a kind of blended um, working environment. So we're hoping very much that. The combination of the video sessions, which will be premiering every Monday at 11 ET, um, and the Q&A sessions, which are at the same time on Fridays, together with a whole lot of chat and learning together on the Discord um, hybrid working channel, um, and also um, the resources that we provide will help you along this way. Before we go and talk about the course goals, and Lauren, I know you'll want to jump in there and tell folks what to expect there. I just want to give you a little taste of what's in store for the next four weeks. Um, so this week, we're going to focus on unpacking hybrid working. Um, next week, we're going to dive down a little bit deeper and think about our relationship to digital tools and platforms in the virtual workplace. Then in week three, we get into actually looking at the hacks. So we have a whole hybrid hacks bonanza planned for you where there's lots to explore um, and have fun with. And then bringing this all together, um, all the things that we do throughout the weeks, we're going to help you set up your own hybrid working roadmap in week four and make sure you have a plan going forward of what you want to focus on. So each week we're going to take one part of the map and complete it. And then at the end of the course, you should have a complete, um, yeah, a complete roadmap. Um, Lauren, did you want to talk a little bit about the course goals and what folk can expect? Definitely. I think, uh, and, and thanks Marin for giving the outline. I think, you know, hybrid working or working in general looks different for everyone, right? Um, it's no, it's it's not a um, a secret that everyone has a, a different way that they like to learn and they like to work. Um, and so when you pull folks into a hybrid or a virtual remote setting, um, those working models are highlighted. Um, you know, and so I, I'm really excited. I think over the the next couple of weeks, I'm really looking forward to just spending time reflecting on our own personal working habits. Um, and also understanding, uh, you know, our relationship with digital tools as they are now and thinking about the ways that they're impacting the work that we do. Um, I'm also excited just to talk about uh, connecting with others in virtual settings and making sure that, um, you know, we have hacks or tips in place to uh, do the best collaborative work possible, um, you know, or even um, the best personal work possible in these settings. Um, and then also just making sure that, you know, we have a plan forward. So, you know, my my goal, at least personally, is to walk away feeling like I've um, kind of cleaned up my own working habits, cleaned up how I'm using these digital tools to work for me, and also um, making sure that I've got good habits in place going forward uh, using that hybrid working wheel. Right. Um, I mean, I hope everybody else is going to jump in and share their hopes um, on the Discord channel. Um, we'd love to know what your priorities are. Um, so please use the Q&A um, during the session and also share your comments. We'll be picking them up throughout the week. Um, one thing before we move over and talk about the hybrid working environment and the splot side, I just wanted to make one more point, which is around how hard folk in edtech have been working for the last few years you know it's been an incredibly tough um period and i think i'm not really sure i'm seeing the, the you know the downtime or the kind of like oh now we're good you know but it, it's all achieved now let's um let's build on that instead it you know for many people it can be um a con maybe not a continuation of a crisis mode but certainly um much more at tech at scale, which in some ways is great, but also means resources are very stretched. Um, and also a lot of negotiation, I think, with folk who whose only experience of um, educational technology came through the pandemic. And I, I think many people didn't have an ideal experience during that period. So I think hopefully this course will 
provide you with um, a calm and supportive environment in which to kind of take a moment and just reflect and take a breath. Okay, what do you think, Lauren? Should we talk a little bit about um, getting sharing on this blog site? I know quite a few folk have already started jumping into that. I think so. Yeah, um, this is something that's been super exciting to watch, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it build over uh, the next couple of weeks as well, and just seeing how other folks are, what you're looking at each day, right? Because I think so many times when we're meeting in these sorts of environments, Maren, I can see your background, I can see the plants and, uh, you know, the frames behind you, but I'm not seeing what you're looking at each day. Um, and so I think the spot could be a helpful way at that. <laughs> That's right. Well, um, for everyone who has um, heard me before, you'll probably know that I have a little um, four-legged working companion, um, Posey, um, who is on this plot and a big part of my hybrid working environments. If you ever see me do like this um, <laughs> during the recording, this is me batting off an over-enthusiastic puppy um, who is now 18 months old, but she doesn't quite know that. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> um, someone joining us for the recording as well. Super well-behaved recording. <laughs> oh, awesome. Okay. Um, so in the just to wrap up with the welcome post, I just want to make sure that um we just touch base on what you can explore from that if you haven't already done that. Um have a look at building connections with virtual teams, which is where we have a little chat um, at the OER 22 conference um, earlier this year, um, setting out some of our thinking and some of our inspiration, which ultimately informed the, the shaping of this course. Um, and then one of the things I want to jump into um, a little bit later on in the session is for us to come around to exploring modes of working, um, which is from Leading Virtual Teams, which is a book I've written on hybrid working. And so hopefully we can explore that a little bit with folk today and see how, how that can be applied to their context. Absolutely. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into it as well. Um, so did you want to start first then jumping right in today and chatting about um, the article that folks might have had a chance to read uh, before today's session? And if not, we'll make sure that the links are all available as well. Uh, I think that the article that we're discussing is when do we actually need to meet in person? Right. Yeah. Thanks, Lauren. And um, every week um, in our sessions, we are going to bring in some different perspectives and voices from different communities. So hopefully give you some inspiration to look outside of your immediate environment and have a little bit of a think about how what you do um, relates to what's happening across the sector um, or indeed um, in a different industry. So. The article is really about um, thinking you know, about the sort of old bugbear of, does this really have to be a meeting? Am I just sitting here wasting my time? This meeting could have been an email. Um, and kind of moving on from this kind of um, experience, which I think we can all relate to, to thinking around uh, what sort of thought processes and decision-making processes do you ideally want to have in place in order to decide can you meet online? Is it an email? Are you going to have to meet in person? And so the article goes and explores um, whether meetings are relationship based, for example, team building days, or maybe conflict resolution or task based. So, for example, developing a curriculum plan or delivery plan for a new course, um, considering how complex the objectives of the meetings are. Um, and then it provides a really handy um, illustration um, where it sort of shows where, you know, if for example, it's low complexity and the goal to be accomplished is basically information transfer, maybe you don't need to meet at all, maybe it could be an email um, or maybe it could be online. Um, and then thinking about sort of how to make use of hybrid formats and then suggesting um, where value lies in meeting in person. And one of the reasons why we've included this in this week's sort of hybrid working unpacked is that I think it can be a lot more nuanced 
a hybrid working experience, then you know basically like you have a um, Slack maybe or a different um, instant messaging service and just kind of say okay there you go that's it now problem solved <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated than that and i hope this article can start us thinking around those considerations so lauren do you want to jump in here and what are your thoughts on this yeah um thanks Marin. i had a I, I read through this article a few times now because i think it makes a lot of good points but i also have um maybe some critiques based on my experience working in a remote setting and leading a virtual team that, you know, really does try to prioritize connection um, and striking that balance between, okay, less is more in terms of meeting and trying to avoid meeting just to meet, but also knowing that you know, if done right, meetings should be prioritizing that connection. And that's really important for that work to happen. And so that's something that I, you know, it, it's like hitting a moving target, trying to find, um, you know, the, the right balance of meetings, right? But I think one of the, the first things that um, I took away from the article um, was right in the beginning, um, I think the quote was, without the ability to bump into one another in an office setting, you have to schedule every interaction. And that really resonated with me because I that that hits it right on the head in terms of how we have to think in our, our Slack environment. So to, to kind of back up for a second, Reclaim is entirely remote. So we use Slack as our primary virtual office space. Uh, we do have email, but that's not something that we really try to use to connect. Um, and then we also have um, Asana as our transparent to-do list space, and we'll get into um, more of the tools and how we work with those next week. But I think for the purposes of where I wanted to start today, it was thinking about how we're scheduling that time for connection, because you're, you're right, you can't just bump into someone in an office setting and say, oh, yeah, you know, how was your weekend? Or, you know, how did that go for you? Or, you know, you, you look like you're, you know, are you feeling okay? Like you can't have that same um, pulse on your team. And so that's really done through meetings uh, for us and also through Slack connections. And so um, I think one of the ways that I try to combat that idea of not meeting just to meet, but also knowing that it is important um, is to have health full pathways in place for unscheduled connection. Uh, and for us, what has worked uh, in the last many months, I would say, so Slack huddles were just recently introduced uh, quite a while ago, but they've been really helpful for our team to just say, hey, you wanna jump on a quick call and just, you know, talk about this or, you know, look at this issue together. Uh, we've also recently started doing um, kind of this impromptu working hour where there's no real agenda. It's not a meeting in the same way where in, we don't have things to get through. It doesn't have to be efficient. It's just a chance for our team to jump on a call and work alongside each other. And the conversation can go wherever it wants. And they're completely optional to join. It has nothing to do with you know, again, performance or anything, it's just a chance to connect. Um, and then we also try to, you know, integrate different mediums uh, of connection as well. So radio shows or podcasts, uh, Discord chats, we've even started doing Music Mondays where someone can uh, control the, the podcast or not the podcast, but the playlist for a while. Um, just again, trying to get at that idea that everyone connects differently, they learn differently and they work differently. And sometimes, um, you know, jumping on another call and the working hour thing might not work for you if you've got fatigue from meetings. So, but listening to a playlist and tuning in and saying like, oh yeah, I love that song and sharing a GIF in Slack or something, that is another way to connect too without being on a meeting. So um, I know that's kind of a lot, but Maren, I just wanted to throw that out as sort of a first uh, maybe point of conversation just around scheduled versus unscheduled connections. 
I think that's a really important point and a really interesting insight into you know how you're trying to blend blend those different modes of interaction. And when you were speaking, one of the things um, that came up for me, and that's also related to the article, is that you know in higher ed, I think there is a, a really broad spectrum of expectation, but also ability. So I think we're seeing everything from folk who are kind of like scheduling meetings in person again, because that's what they used to do and they don't have to be online if it's safe to meet in person, to you know institutions who are adopting kind of really quickly like policies to say like, oh, you can now work from home, like any day you choose, but you have to be in for this day. And oh, I've, I've had so many stories of folk who are like, I'm in my office, there's no one else here, or, you know, which, which kind of totally negates the, the whole point of, of going anywhere to connect. Right. Because if you're the only person who choose Fridays, then, you know, there's no one there to connect with. And that is, I think, a really good example of why this requires thought, right? This isn't kind of going to be solved by, in the long run, it's not gonna be a good experience um, by not being designed properly. And similar to you know, how we design student interactions online, it, it's always, you know, we need to learn from virtual learning and for virtual working and, and really start to curate those experiences. And just before you jump back in, I think the, the big factor here is also the skill and confidence level. So, you know, in order to be informal using technical um, technology or tools rather, you need to have a certain comfort level to kind of, you know, use different tools to jump in on radio shows or Slack channels. And these tools also need to be available. So there is quite a lot, I think, to unpack in that area. And yeah, if you um, have some thoughts on this, please put them in the chat or share them on Discord. We'd love to to hear your experiences there as well. Absolutely. Um, and I, th I think while, while folks are writing in, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about while you were talking, you know, I've taken meetings with folks from other schools that say exactly that, that they're in sort of this hybrid working schedule at the moment. And that means that their colleagues, you know, they're on alternating shifts about who, who goes into campus on what days. And so as a result, you more than likely are always still, you know, working with someone who is remote, right? And so to say, oh, I, I'm in the office now, you, you know, while it's unavoidable to think that, you know, just because you're in the office doesn't mean you're not going to have to adhere to hybrid working models in order to collaborate with others, you know, in a virtual setting. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's definitely the challenge. And I thought that the article did a good job of trying to, um, you know, elaborate just on how putting together and facilitating virtual events or hybrid events, especially, is so challenging. It's something that Reclaim has really struggled with in the past. I think we're, you know, we've really, um, you know, we have a plan and a, a workflow for doing complete virtual events. But anytime we are, we're running an in-person event, and, and Maren, I know you can probably relate to this, the question is usually, well, can I tune in remotely? And right. that you know, it, it completely changes the game. And I think that the the author of this article, you know, hit that on the, on the head, basically saying that if in, done incorrectly, you can really sideline or alienate those virtual participants. And so until you have that done right, and you know, you can do it right, it's, it, you know, it can be kind of a, a gray area for sure. That's such an important point. I wonder whether we just take a couple of minutes um, to think about the language we use to talk about these different ways of working. And um, I wanted to maybe share um, one of the documents we, we already put into this week's post, um, which is a document that we can use to start thinking about how we use these different terms and, and what different modes of working um, we're talking about. So, I wanted to also use this to reflect on, you know, this really not being a new thing. Like digital technology is kind of incidental to working from home 
which is, you know, historically speaking, a very long tradition. If you really think about, you know, like individual craftspeople or uh, small industries um, over 100 years ago, working from home used to be a very normal thing. Um, and having, you know, having your own um, workshop or, or specialism in your own and living there was not an unusual thing. So it's not a... Um, a kind of completely new concept but I think during 2020 in particular during the pandemic it took on a, a very contemporary um, meaning and it's worth I think stepping back from that and having a think so um, throughout this course we're going to try and use these different terms to describe different modes of working so home working the practice of working from home hybrid working working both at home and from um, office or from on campus working as a virtual team. So this could be a whole blend of different modes of working, but the primary way of working is digital workflows and communications. So I think Lauren, I think your team would be a great example um, how you describe that. Um, there's also distributed working, which folk who work for larger institutions in particular might really identify with. So if you have different campuses, um, this doesn't necessarily have to be um, you know, facilitated by digital means. And um, if you think back about the um, old days of like the UK's Open University, for example, um, where, you know, mailed out assignments constituted kind of work and study um, or, or, you know, um, also radio and TV, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, digital technology that's used to facilitate distributed working. And then also remote working, um, which I think many of us are experiencing is all around a central hub, such as a compass or um, a company HQ. Um, and I think it's important to consider whether this applies to you as well as being a hybrid worker, because very likely if you're working in higher ed, you're working through to a central hub where things, people, resources are located. And a lot of institutions have policies that are kind of designed to envisage everybody being in the same place and working in the same way, um, rather than being able to reflect the kind of broad reality, which is much more messy and much more complex. Um, so thanks for sharing that, um, Lauren. I thought it would just be helpful to kind of unpack that a little bit. Um, what are your thoughts on, on those different terms? And what is your experience of that? Yeah, um, and let me just pull the visual back up because I, I find that it's helpful just to have something to reference while we're talking about them. You know, I think um, for me personally, the the work that I am most familiar, I, I feel like, you know, I have worked in many of these modes at, at various points. Um, you know, I, I would say now I'm in the homeworking category uh, for the most part. I, I work every day from my home office. That's where I am now. And so my commute is really waking up in the morning and going into the office or going to a dedicated work zone um, in my house. But I have also been, you know, in that hybrid working model where I've, you know, spent a couple of days working at our Fredericksburg office and then one or two days, you know, at home. Um, Obviously, we're I'm a part of a, of a distributed team and that folks are working across various locations, uh, various time zones, and that's something you have to take into consideration as well. Um, and then, um, you know, working as a virtual team right there with you as well. So um, definitely feel like I can relate to many of these uh, mm -hmm. just in over the course of, of years working for Reclaim. Um, and they, they do come with their own challenges and, and benefits too. <laughs> well, um, we'd really love to hear um, what your thoughts are, which of these modes of working have you experienced? Um, what is currently dominating your experience of work? And um, Lauren, I think just before we jump into kind of a more practical part of, of this week's session, where we're gonna start um, actually working together and collaborating together, um, I just wanted to kind of ask in terms of like how things have changed for you for the past sort of two to three years, um, what would you say is kind of like the the thing that you reflect on that's sort of like a big difference? And just to share my example, I think before um, before the pandemic hit, I think many people 
when I said, oh, I don't have an office or I'm based from home, they were like, really? You know, you're not, you're not, you're not somewhere. What's your address? Like, <laughs> like registering a mailbox without a physical office address was quite difficult. Um, so I think many people were, um, were quite sort of surprised. And even if they were familiar with the idea of home working, they didn't think this was a dominant or, or prevalent um, way of doing things. And now when I tell people that I'm working from home, they're like, oh yeah, well, so do I, you know, and I'm basically, I've got my laptop, I've got the kitchen table, you know, there's dogs, kids, complete chaos very often. Um, or, you know, there could be like a bed set where I'm kind of sitting in this corner and, you know, a lot of folk now have the sense that the sort of emergency response to not being able to safely go and co-locate with other colleagues is kind of the reality of, you know, hybrid or home working long term. And I think that does worry me because for a lot of folk, that is not the ideal situation. And there should be more support from an employer point of view, but also support for skills development. Um, so uh, that is one of the things that does kind of worry me at the moment. Yeah, I think you raise a really good point. And I saw that that kind of coming through the article even as well. Like, um, I think the author at one point was saying, you know, instead of doing another meeting, the um, the supervisor now records the the updates for the week. And that gives folks the flexibility to listen to it as they're going on a jog or making dinner. And I immediately was my red flags went up because I think just because we have the benefit and the flexibility of being in a home working environment and don't get me wrong, that's great. Your commute's shorter. You can get up and walk around the block and be with your pets and, you know, or your, your children or, you know, but it's, it's still really important to have those boundaries and to treat it like a full-time job in that you are going to work and dedicating time to work. And then you're also switching off and leaving work, even if it's just leaving your desk or leaving your working zone or whatever that looks like. Um, and so I thought that that's where that article was a little problematic because I don't want my colleagues or the folks, you know, if I've given someone directives for a project, I don't want them doing that while they're making dinner. Absolutely not. You know, so I think <laughs> like having those boundaries are still really, really important. And, and I think also what you said just about knowing that, okay, we're going to have to ramp up our technical skills in order to use these tools, you know, for a successful working working environment that's really important too and i think over the this summer in particular we've spent um, more time as a team in that strategic space thinking about time management thinking about you know navigating and working on meetings um, as opposed to just focusing on the content or you know the professional development technically right but actually spending time developing and improving on just how we're working because i think ultimately that does make us more successful um you know em employees on our own paths but also as part of a larger team and also you know personally with our mental health i think that that that's that that has to be prioritized and it can't be overlooked in these settings so um that's something that i you know am really excited to, to continue chatting about as well. I'm not sure if that's uh, where your head goes with, with this type of conversation, but that's definitely where, where I'm thinking. I really hope that all of you, you know, joining in for this course will have similar thoughts and priorities because that's what, you know, Hacks for Hybrid Working is really all about. It's meant to give you ways to think about things, practical approaches, tools, resources, to kind of start reflecting and starting to get a sense of which parts of how you currently work work for you, not just today, but long term, and which don't. And there might be some aspects that you don't have much control over. There might be others that you do have some control over. So I think Lauren, we're probably ready to jump in and talk about our practical exercise for the week, um, because this tool is designed to help you do just that. Um, and it's called the, the Wheel of Hybrid Working. 
And Lauren and I are going to demo that for you now um, and share the template, which is also in this week's um, post, and also talk you through every step of the way on how to use it and what you can do with it. So we hope that um, hybrid working will fit many of you, but this template um, does contain versions of all different ways of working. So if hybrid working doesn't feel the ideal fit for you, then just choose one of the other ones. Um, and you can also try and do more than one, see if you get different results, um, if you have different reflections. Um, but the way it works is the same for everyone. So we are going to use this example to just share how it works and what to do. Um, you can either complete this template digitally and download it, either use it in um, Google Slides or PowerPoint, something like that. Um, you can print it out. Um, hopefully, you can adapt it in whatever format works for you. And if you want to take this completely offline, just with pencil and paper, you can absolutely do that too. Um, we hope that some of you might feel comfortable sharing your thoughts and results um, with us on Discord. But also, if you just want to keep it to yourself, um, the point is really that you should try and reflect for yourself um, as honestly as you can. So the wheel is divided into um, eight different areas. And many of you maybe come across a similar tool called the Wheel of Life or familiar with that. But the idea is really to reflect on different common areas um, that impact on the way we work and to try and give them a score. Now, in this example that um, I've completed ahead of time, I've put some example scores in. And ideally, we want you to assign a score from 1 to 10. Now, if you assign a lower score, for example, one, two, or maybe three, um, that would pre present an area which is challenging for you or which might require attention. If you have a high score in an area, maybe a seven, eight, nine, or even a 10, that would represent a way of working which is currently working well for you, something that has a positive impact. Um, and there's also a blank space for you to add your own categories. Eight categories is quite a lot to reflect on, so hopefully you won't need to add more. But if you have a burning category that you really want to add, um, just please use the space provided and add one in. Now, I want to say a few things about um, what it means to have a low score or a high score. So in the example I've shared, socializing with colleagues is a score three, and that's the lowest score on that board. Um, also, Collaboration, which is the category I added, has a low score, which is four. Now, you might be an introverted colleague who is not so keen to do a lot of socializing with folk um, after work. You may be quite happy to be socializing on Slack and leave it at that. Um, you might be quite happy with a score of three for socializing with colleagues if it's not an important category to you. A low score doesn't mean that you necessarily want to take some action. On the other hand, if, for example, work-life balance is super important to you, seven might be not a good enough score. And you're like, oh, I think it's only a seven out of 10. I would like it to be a 10 out of 10. This is the thing I'm going to focus on for the next four weeks. The wheel isn't about judgment or performance. There are no right or wrong answers. Um, if you give low scores across the board or high scores across the board, there is no right or wrong. The main purpose of it is to help you reflect on how you feel it's going and to just give you that moment to take a breath. Um, in a minute, I'm going to come to you, Lauren, and see what areas you identified and, and what your scores were and see what you might want to share with us. But just to kind of um, emphasize, we are going to be using this hybrid working wheel um, as part of our roadmap. And in next week's sessions, we are going to show you exactly what to do and how to do that. But hopefully it will help you identify one or maybe two areas um, that you particularly want to focus on throughout the course. And with that, um, Lauren, what was it like for you to complete this? What are your thoughts? Have you identified any areas you want to be focusing on? Yeah, you know, um, in kind of preparation for this course, I have to say that I've cheated a little bit and like, you know, I cleaned up my my workspace and, you know, definitely uh, set the tone a little bit and knew that this is where we were headed 
uh, this fall with this conversation. And so I've been thinking about, you know, my work-life balance and my physical and mental health and, and things like that. I'm really reflecting a lot this summer in particular. Um, so for me, you know, I would say that, you know, when I was taking a look at the, the working wheel, um, the the commute for me was actually surprisingly low and that people might be like, Lauren, your commute is 10 seconds. How could that be low for you? Um, but I am a night <laughs> owl. I do not like waking up in the mornings. And so for me, remote working and, and working from home has been great because I can sleep to the last minute. But I also know that I'm much happier if I wake up earlier and I start my day and I give myself time before work, um, you know, to make coffee or go on a walk with my dog, um, you know, to read the news or whatever. And so um, that is something that I would like to improve on in the coming weeks is just being really um, kind of focused on or intentional on building that more into my schedule and actually making a commute, even if it's mentally to work. Uh, so that's something that I'm uh, particularly interested in doing. Um, mm -hmm. I also think, too, for me, the work-life balance has been tricky in the past because even though my day will end um, and I, you know, create those physical boundaries for myself and I leave this room and I do other things, I'm still thinking about work or that's something that has mm -hmm. uh, been a struggle for me in the past where I can't turn my brain off. And then I'm thinking about my to-do list or, you know, what I'm working on the next day or things that, you know, I may be just unsure about or something like that. And I just mull through these ideas in my head and to the point where I'm still mentally exhausting myself, even though I'm on my own time. So mm -hmm. that's something that, you know, I, I've really tried to work on particularly this summer um, and is something that I am still going to be, you know, really focusing on in the coming weeks as well is just making sure that I'm setting up good habits towards the end of my day or at the beginning of my day where I feel like, okay, I've got a plan for the next day. So there's no real reason for me to be thinking through all of these things, on, mm -hmm. you know, through the evening. Um, I'm not sure if you can relate to that. Um, <laughs> well, I think everyone in the room can relate to that. Um, I, I would be very surprised if if there were folk in a room said, oh, no, I've never had that problem. Um, I've never thought about work after 5 p.m. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, uh, work-life balance is tricky. So, um, like you, I've, I've worked so hard at this and, and tried all kinds of different strategies for making sure work-life balance kind of does exist and has a balance but um yeah the last few years I just feel like every time I figure it out there's like a new emergency or new context in which you know I, I need to reinvent that all the time and one of the things that this really makes me reflect on is how much my approach to working in a hybrid kind of workplace is evolving over time um it, it changes a lot through circumstances you know in my life like last year when I had a puppy um it was incredible like the amount of time that took like out of my working day and you know the amount of things that got destroyed not to, not to mention but I think that was really tough um and I also highlighted collaboration and I would be interested to hear um, what folks experience of that is so at the moment my in my team and my media team I have a whole range of colleagues um, who have started working with us very recently who've worked with us for many years um, so some of them have been you know seeing us through the pandemic some of them joined us beforehand and i think it's really difficult for folk to continuously upskill and adopt new tools like we're just about to adopt a tool like asana and um, i already know that half of my team are going to be like really really yeah. i am so busy is this really necessary that i'm learning a whole new workflow which is going to completely change how i manage every project um and i think the bigger your institution the more work it is to kind of get that sort of collaboration and the tools for collaboration um like 
across everyone and, and also to update it continuously. Um, we are a Google Apps for Education user and you know, boy, is it unhelpful that they iteratively release updates without notice or they tell you on the day, they're like, hey, today Hangouts is completely different. And you're like, oh, <laughs> all my meetings have just disappeared. So thanks for that. Yeah. So yeah, I think this is where, you know, big tech um, is, is super unhelpful in the virtual workplace. Well, yeah. I, so a couple of things to say to that. One, you know, tool fatigue, I think is just as real as meeting fatigue, where it's like, oh, you know, everybody has this new platform that's just going to change the game. And I, you know, I yeah. think, you know, some of them are, are very valid and have a real purpose, but it has to be helpful for you. It has to be a natural part of the work that you do. And I think anytime you're talking about using a new tool or a platform, it needs to aid, not take time to use, you know, where it's like, if I've got to stop what I'm doing and go input data in here just to check a box, that's, no, that's efficient for no one, right? But if it's actually helping me you know, by collecting things so I'm more efficient or something, you know, there might be a real purpose there. But yeah, I completely relate to the idea too of, you know, then, okay, you become ingrained with a tool and then suddenly they change their entire entire model and, you you know, you realize that everything you were leaning on is now like, <laughs> you know, feeling a bit rocky. We're, we're feeling that even with cPanel uh, and WHM at the moment. And that's something that we can talk about more next week as well, where we're now faced as a team with, okay, all of our training, all of our documentation is built on cPanel and WHM looking a certain way. And they've completely right. thrown that on its head. And so not only are we having to relearn where things are, but we have to be experts enough to teach others. And then yeah. we have to update, you know, so much documentation that it's just, we have a mountain of work in front of us. And so that's definitely something to think about when we're talking about collaborative tools for sure. Um, but I, I agree. I think collaboration in general is uh, something that I could probably, you know, do a better job. You, there, you can always improve for that category for sure. And I think Reclaim as a whole does a great job of collaborating on projects. In fact, it's something that I'm, I'm really proud of because I think our teams can jump in on so many different projects and work cross-functionally, which is wonderful. Um, you know, but it, it can still be a challenge sometimes in virtual settings where you do feel rather isolated. You know, I, I, I look around, I'm by myself, you know, and so building yeah. in that time to collaborate is an intentional choice. As you said, it's, we have to be intentional about setting up working environments for th these priorities. One of my favorite experiences of sort of, you know, collaboration fails is like um, a few years ago, a colleague was showing me something on a spreadsheet and, you know, I'm a, I'm a good spreadsheet user, you know, I'm not like amazing, but I'm skilled. And we were like online for like an hour sharing the screen, talking about it. I just couldn't do it. And then in the end, it turned out that he was just pressing a keyboard shortcut. And he was like, this is so obvious. Obviously, you know, that you press this button. And I was like, this is not a keyboard shortcut I've ever come across. Yeah. So keyboard shortcuts is one of those things where if you're sitting next to someone, is the most obvious thing in the universe. But if you are remotely desktop sharing. It's magic. You know? right, it is. It is literally magic. It just appears. And you're like, wait, it, it can't replicate yeah. this. And it's one of those examples where, you know, you can, frustration and kind of, you know, miscommunication can so easily creep in. Mm -hmm. And like someone leaves the meeting thinking, well, you know, I'm really failing at this. And the other person leaves thinking, my God, you know, how can you not get this? Like, and, and, you know, these things can go wrong and spiral very quickly. Um, so the question really, just to come back to our hybrid working wheel, and I know that many folk in the room will want to kind of share their own views and thoughts, um, is really to just think about the overall picture. And once you've completed it, reflect on the scores and just have a think and say, okay, which of these scores would I like to change? Um, it may be a high score that you want to even get better and maybe a low score that you want to um, increase or you may not decide that um, something needs change but there's something you're really curious about or really frustrated about or something that you wish you could do something about 
even though within the practical constraints of your working environment or higher ed um, environment you work in, it's not as easy to change all that. So in whatever mode you're completing this, um, do you try and pick one or two things that you want to focus on? Um, and that's one of the things we're going to use for next week. And I know, Lauren, we're nearly at the time where we're going to start our roundup and reminding folk of what's coming up next week. So are you ready to jump into that? Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. You know, I I can't believe I did that. I tried really hard not to, to <laughs> at this point, you know, in the game. But here, if... I guess it's unavoidable, but yes, that sounds great. I'm really looking forward to uh, following along with the, the working wheel over the next course of sessions um, and looking forward to just continuing these conversations in the Discord chat and also later this week as well, um, you know, where we can just check in on how folks are getting along with that um, and also just continue these conversations too around, you know, hybrid working in general, and maybe we'll chat about the article and all good things. So yeah, you want to take us from here, Maren? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we want to encourage you all to keep posting on this blog site. Um, I want to see pictures of coffee cups and dogs, cats, maybe your commute, yeah. whether that would be a staircase or maybe it's a walk to campus, or maybe something completely different um, that makes your hybrid working environment special. Um, I know of a few folk who've got craft items in and around their offices, you know, cushions, um, maybe posters, uh, sports equipment. I'm reliably informed that at least two people I know have vinyl setups in their offices. So you may decide that something that we haven't thought at all about is important to you. And we hope that you'll share it with us so that we can all have a look at this sort of tapestry of hybrid working as it is developing. Yeah, I have to say too, I'm I'm really interested in seeing people's um desk layouts. Uh, uh -huh. something that our our team at Reclaim talks about all the time. I think Meredith put out a big blog post on it recently. And I know Taylor just recently uh put out a tweet and he's got, you know, a vertical monitor and all of his radio, you know, things set up as well. So um and then Jim, meanwhile, is living in an arcade basement. So, you know, I think everybody <laughs> has their own set up and I'm really looking forward to seeing how people use um, these tools to work for them. So, Well, I've got a, a small fun fact before we jump into what's um, in store for next week. Um, the area around your desktop um, that you're looking at is called a geekosphere. And there's an interesting research article about that that I'm going to share um, on Discord. So if you're um, into that sort of thing, there is research for you out there that I'll be sharing with you. There are people watching this who are interested in that, believe me. So that's all. Awesome. I'll be seeing you on Discord and we can have a lot of conversation around that. I'm looking forward to it. Great. So. So what's up for next week? So next week, um, we are going and focusing on tools and platforms. Um, one of the things we've reflected on a lot when designing this course is how important the relationship is between us as human beings and digital tools, particularly when it comes to hybrid working and virtual working. So I know that Lauren, you're really passionate about next week. Is there anything in particular you think folks should be looking forward to? Um, so I just was writing this little banner while we were talking here, um, but yes, I'm super excited for next week. This is kind of my bread and butter, just thinking about how we're using these digital tools to work best for us and not just integrating a new tool because it looks pretty or we, you know, just because, right? We need to be really particular about what we're using. Um, I'm also excited just to, you know, think about, you know, how we're storing our, our, our data, how we're, you know, if you think about cleaning up your office space, it's just as important to clean up your virtual space too. Um, and so, yeah, definitely looking forward to getting into next week and just reflecting on how we're using digital tools to work for us. And in case, you know, you're arriving here kind of super stressed from the start of term and you're like, I really don't know, what is this all about? I need help. 
Well, help is at hand because we have our weekly Q&A session coming up on Friday. Um, so just drop in. Um, we're going to be there to answer your questions. If you have uh, any problems completing the template, we can help you with that. And also, if you just have any other thoughts, comments, questions, um, things you want to share, um, do please join us on Friday. I'm really looking forward to that conversation. Definitely. And the thing I'll also mention, too, just because I know the hybrid working wheel can get into some personal concepts as well. And so if you're wanting to ask a question, but anonymously, that's also fine too. You don't have to put it in the public discord chat, uh, just, you know, write it to us privately or send it an email or in a Twitter DM or somewhere else. And we will highlight the question without highlighting you. So um, that's something that I'm interested in and, in, in, you know, continuing on this week as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, feel free to share what you feel comfortable sharing and keep to yourself or share with us privately um, what you don't want to be in a public channel. But yeah, keep those um, photos that you are happy to share um, going on in our hybrid working squad site. Awesome. Well, thank you, Marin, uh, for joining this first session. We look forward to uh, chatting with folks uh, in the Discord chat this week and on Friday. So we will see you then. Thank you. See ya.